Today we're going to be tearing down this Nissan Infiniti VQ37 VHR engine to see what's inside and how it works. Now this engine is most commonly found in a Nissan 370Z as well as many Infiniti models. This one's out of an Infiniti G37 from 2009. Now we're going to be tearing down this engine to see just what happened to it. Apparently it has a rod knock issue. But we're also going to find out what makes these engines just so strong and why a lot of people like to follow and build these engines. These engines almost made 350 horsepower right out of the factory. Now taking a look around the engine here, I've already got a VQ. Q35DE teardown video so you might want to check that one out but what makes the 37 VHR so different besides the displacement are these heads here where you've got variable valve timing on the intake side and having lift control using these two electric motors over here. Now looking at the front here you can see we still use a plastic valve cover and this engine is still a port injected engine only where you have your two fuel rails here which feed the respective banks on this side and over on that side. Now the heads themselves, timing cover, block and the lower half are all made of an aluminum alloy underneath the timing cover we still have a timing chain also underneath here we have a timing chain powered water pump now we're going to start at the top here where this valve cover already came loose let's take a look looking under the valve cover here you can see we have a very typical exhaust style camshaft the intake side is where it gets interesting we have what is like two camshafts there's one at the bottom here which is ultimately what's powered by the timing chain then we have one at the top here which is what's powered by the electric motor that sits at the back here and if you look really closely you'll see that they don't actually have a full cam lobe that goes around in fact it has a semicircle lobe here that goes back and forth like that. We'll take this apart and take a look at it a little bit later in the video. Now underneath the valve cover itself we've got a unique baffle system here for the positive crankcase ventilation. Let's start by removing some of these coolant lines here. I'm going to try to remove this variable valve lift motor. Okay we'll remove this piece. Alright so with that cap out of the way it's pretty easy to see how this VVL motor works. You've got this long shaft here that's going to rotate when you apply voltage here and that's going to push down on the spring which is what's going to turn this arm in and out relative to this crankshaft and that's what's going to rotate these rocker arms here to move in and out and thus vary how far you are on the cam profile. Now in order to release this motor from the valve train I have to remove these two allen bolts over here. Now normally there'd be a sensor over here that one's missing but you can see it over here on this side and you can see that mechanism inside there it's actually got a magnet on it now I'm going to repeat pulling the valve cover off this side you can see this car uses a coil on plug style ignition system remove the fuel bracket and I'll just go around and remove all the 10 millimeter bolts oh that was loose probably why these things leak a lot they're plastic I'm also going to pull this fuel rail at the top here can't forget this bolt See here's a spark plug tube seal, so at least these are replaceable. We'll go ahead and remove this piece in front of the VVL motor. Here's what that sensor looks like at the back here. It's most likely a position sensor so the ECU knows where this motor is and thus how much air is going in the engine. Just remove those two hexes. And there's the VVL motor. Now the VQ engines have a giant bowl that sits on top of the engine here for the air intake and this being the VQ37 VHR it has dual throttle bodies that sit on top of that. This here is the lower intake manifold you can see it splits it off into the six individual cylinders and it's held on by a bunch of 12 millimeter bolts that bolt them to the head. And just remove that lower intake manifold and you can see the manifold also has these ports here where the fuel injectors would plug into and spray fuel down to the airstream here. And looking down in between the cylinder banks here you can see there's a giant void under here which usually forms a lot of rat's nest. You've also got the two knock sensors located over here which is sometimes very difficult to get to because you got to do all this work to get it off. Taking a look down inside of the valves there you can see they're actually pretty clean and that's because you've got the gasoline stream that is cleaning off the back of those valves there so you don't have any carbon buildup. Taking a look at the cooling system on this engine you've got a radiator cap at the top here which is going to connect to the radiator bring that coolant down through this metal bypass hose it's not a biodegradable rubber hose unlike some Toyotas that's going to split off into the two heads at the back here which are going to circulate through the heads and then down into the block. Here we've got a coolant temperature sensor I'm going to remove these 12 millimeter nuts Okay, there was no coolant in that. Now one thing I don't like about these wiring harnesses is they can get really brittle and crispy. In order to further disassemble this engine I gotta remove this timing cover because there are bolts here that bolt into the VVL tray and the head itself. Now in order to remove the timing cover itself I need to remove the crank bolt. The bolt is stuck. Meanwhile I'm going to start removing these accessories of the front of the engine here.
Remove that accessory bracket. Now there's a bunch of 14 millimeter bolts that go around the bottom half of the timing cover and 10 millimeter bolts that go across the top half of these timing covers here that I'm going to remove next. And I'm just going to remove the thermostat cover here. And there's a thermostat. going to pop off this upper timing cover here. Now taking a look under these upper timing covers here, you can see this is the cam phaser for the intake side. The exhaust side actually does not have variable valve timing, unlike the older rev up versions of this engine for the VQ35. Here you got the timing chain tensioner, so this is kind of all accessible by just removing this little cover over here. Interesting, it says Hitachi under this cover. I wonder if there's some electronics that they made or something. The oil control solenoids are integrated into this housing as well. You can see the oil feed ports here correspond to these oil feeds over here and on this side over here, and that's going to feed oil up inside of here which is what's going to create which is what's going to send oil to phase these camshaft gears I do have another video on how variable valve timing works if you want to check that out in addition to the variable valve timing solenoid we've also got a cam sensor because this works as a closed loop control circuit this is basically like a Hall effect sensor that's going to pick up the magnetic changes in this ring as it's rotating let's remove the dipstick here if it will come out there we go one of the downsides of the VQ is that in order to get this timing chain cover off to get the heads off, you got to get the crank pulley off, but this is rotating so I can't get that off. You also got to get a couple of bolts at the bottom here that are in the oil pan, which means I got to drop the oil pan out. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this engine over and start taking off the bottom end. All right, here we go. Yeah, I wasn't really expecting all that coolant to drip out. Got my wife's old sweater here that down to sap that up. At the bottom here you can see we've got a small little oil pan situated more towards the front of the engine. Next we're going to remove the 10 millimeter bolts that hold it on. And just pop that off. Yeah it looks pretty yucky inside. Check that out. You can see that there's actually bearing material and some metal inside of here. So this engine definitely chewed up a bearing. There's a bunch of 12 millimeter bolts inside of here and outside here that hold this upper oil pan section on. Oops. Now this here is the upper oil pan. You can see this also houses your oil filter. There is no oil cooler on this version of the engine. We'll take a look at the slime that's inside of here. This is just metal particles that have built up inside of the oil and they've settled down inside of here. All right, now I'm going to remove this oil pickup tube. I don't see any big particles inside of there. Next I'm going to remove the oil baffle. And here we come to the reason why this version of the VQ is even stronger than the original is that this bottom end is built just so strong. They've got this ladder frame here assembly that bolts directly to the block and that has all the main bearings integrated inside so everything is all encased inside instead of using separate main caps or the older ladder design that they've done before. Everything's kind of integrated into one casting so it's built nice and strong. Now the engine overall looks in pretty good shape and is very clean with the exception of piston number five here. The connecting rod looks a little bit burnt up compared to the others so I'm gonna bet that that's the one that chewed up the rod bearing causing the rod now jam something down into the crankshaft let's see if we can break this crankshaft bolt loose here oh, it's on there yes yes there we are so now that the crank pulley is out of the way we can remove the timing cover now the timing cover is pretty straightforward you got two oil feeds over here that go to your variable valve timing for your intake sides and that's pretty much it functionally. Taking a look at the timing chain setup on the VQ37. You can see we've got a crankshaft here which is going to directly drive the oil pump. We've got our plastic timing slides here which are going to power your intake camshafts. The exhaust camshafts are powered by a secondary chain in the back here. We've got our timing chain tensioner over here which is hydraulically actuated. And we've got the water pump located over here. Of course one of the downsides of having your water pump powered by this internal timing chain is that if it does leak externally it could cause coolant and oil to mix and bad things to happen. Now one of the biggest downsides to the HR versions of the VQ engines are that these galley gaskets here leak. Now these oil galleys are these parts here that are screwed together. There's a gasket under here and this carries oil to the VVT heads as well as your timing chain tensioner as well as from the main head of the block off of the oil pump over here. The gasket that's in behind here could disintegrate and that's going to cause an internal oil leak for the oil pressure that's built up inside of there to spew out internally into this timing cover and then it's just going to go back down towards the sump. Now that's not an external oil leak. It's not something you notice until it's almost too late and your oil lights tends to come on and then at that point you could probably have starved the engine of oil. Now I'm going to start by removing the timing chain tensioner. I might go flying here. So now that that's loose, I can get some of this chain off here. 
and there's the chain. Now the chain slides as well as the tensioners were not exactly a strong point on these engines either, but this one seems to have been in good shape. Now we're gonna go ahead and remove these VVT gears. Now these two secondary chain tensioners are also spring-loaded and hydraulically actuated. Let's remove this chain slide. This one's an 8mm hex. And that's the tensioner slider. Let's pull out the water pump. Okay, no coolant. Let's remove the oil pump next. Of course, one of the downsides of this engine is that things are very complicated, being timing chain driven. You got a lot of bolts inside of here that we got to remove next between the heads as well as the block in order to get this rear timing cover off. All right, I think I got all the bolts. There we are. There's the inner timing cover. And on the back of that timing cover, you can see we've got our main oil galley here that runs from the oil pump side down to the middle of the block, as well as the water pump cut out over here that matches what's on the block. Now the VQ37 and HR versions only came with longitudinally mounted rear wheel drive based setups, which means that you've got the engine mounts over here on the side of the block, as opposed to in front and then on the transmission side. Now since the engine is already upside down on the stand, I think I'm going to take apart the bottom end first and then go take the heads off. Now the cool thing is the main bearings are held in by these four bolts each for each bearing. There's a total of four bearings here and this frame is also held onto the block by a bunch of 12 millimeter bolts that go all the way around here. So we're going to start by removing those first. Now the main bearing bolts are an E-Torx E14 socket. I'm going to go ahead and break those loose. It's amazing that there's 16 of these. And they're actually pretty coarse thread too. Look how long they are. Next up, I'm going to remove the connecting rod bolts. These are a 10 millimeter 12 point socket. All right, I'll just remove that. This is the one that heated up. And I can see that there is no bearing there. And it looks pretty scored up. And there is no bearing over here. The one that's adjacent to it actually has a bearing. Now if we take a closer look at the connecting rod bearing that is spun here, you can see a piece of the bearing sticking out here and another piece of the bearing sticking out here. Now normally you'd have your connecting rod cap and then a bearing between it and this crankshaft surface. Now when things heat up due to lack of lubrication, this connecting rod bearing might stick to the crankshaft and actually spin 180 degrees or so to be like this. And then you end up with no bearing over on this side and that's why this is all scored up as well as no bearing on the crankshaft and that's why it's all scored up. And here you can see a piece of this bearing sticking up here which used to be the bearing that's supposed to be protecting this crankshaft and it's spun around. So essentially now you don't have any bearing between this crankshaft and your connecting rod cap so you've got a gap there and then when you start to rev the engine you hear knock knock noises. And that's what you call rod knock and you pretty much have to tear down the engine in order to fix that crankshaft and put a new set of bearings in. Alright, let's check these two bearings here. This one looks pretty clean and the bearing is present. This one's got a bearing and it looks pretty clean as well. Uh-oh, this bearing doesn't look very healthy. You can see it's very discolored from overheating and it's got scores on it. And this is a classic reason why you need to check your engine oil. These VQs are known to burn oil. In addition to that oil galley issue, it can run low on oil and then start to eat up your bearings and tell knock-knock jokes. Alright, I'm going to take off this ladder frame. Oh my goodness, it's so heavy. Now the fact that this is one big cast piece is what really makes this engine so strong. You can see we got the main bearings here. A little bit of scoring, but they're not too bad. Now, unlike many other engines, this one still uses a pressed in rear main seal instead of a bolt-on one. I can go ahead and remove this crankshaft. Check out this connecting rod bearing. You can see how torn up it is. Very deep grooves inside of here from overheating. That came from piston number one. I always wonder why the main bearings fare really well compared to the connecting rod bearings when you run out of oil. So now that we finished disassembling the bottom end, we're going to turn this back over and remove the head. Now unlike normal VQ engines that have individual cam bearings, this one actually has an entire cradle at the top here which needs to be removed separately and then you can get those camshafts out. That actually helps to make it a lot stronger and it also houses the variable valve lift system over here. Go ahead and remove a lot more 10 millimeter bolts. And I can also remove this exhaust camshaft. I noticed that the bearing surface on here is a little bit scored up. Now the head bolts on VQs are 10 millimeter hex. Yeah, they're tight. I'll just go ahead and run these up with my impact. And I'll just go ahead and remove the driver's side head. All of the crust here indicates that there has been some sort of oil burning going on over a long period of time. Now the head gasket itself is made of a multi-layer steel. Now we're pretty much going to do the same thing over on this side here. And remove the camshaft. Crack these head bolts loose. And let's get the right side head off. Did I forget a bolt or what?
Man, I'll remove that head. Oh, it looks so crusty. So crusty. I'm gonna go ahead and push these pistons out. Got the pistons removed and boy are they caked up with carbon. I'm gonna go ahead and get the block off the stand and take a closer look. So we've got the engine completely torn down here. Let's take a look inside to see just how it works. Now we're gonna start here at the oil pan. Here we've got the oil pump, which is directly driven off of the crankshaft. That's going to bring in oil through the pickup tube over here and send it in through this upper oil pan over here. Then go past the oil pressure switch through the oil filter and then back into the engine block. Now this engine was in pretty good condition and this is a genuine Nissan oil filter. So this engine must have been really well maintained. Next up we have the lower half of this engine block. As I mentioned before, this cradle is what makes this engine so strong. Now the oil from the oil filter is going to head up through this hole over here straight into the main engine block. Now the older VQ35DE engines had a much simpler ladder frame design at the bottom end. This one's a lot more built and strong. Next we come to the crankshaft and that's where you can see this engine kind of failed here. Here's the spun connecting rod bearing for piston number five. You can see that the one bearing has spun on top of the other bearing and it's completely stuck together. It's also got these little grooves on the side here from the compression of the piston moving up and down with no oil. You can see the other bearing surfaces here are quite scored up. The main bearings are not as bad, but the connecting rod bearing suffered a lot worse. Now taking a look at the pistons on the VQ37, you can see that it has these really tiny oil control rings, which I hate. A lot of newer engines are moving to smaller ones because you got a lot of tighter tolerances, thinner oils. But the downside to that is that it can clog up and that's what causes these engines to burn oil. You can see a lot of the oil was left in the combustion chamber and that's why we've got these flaked up pieces of oil and carbon built up inside of here. And that also means that you have to check your oil more frequently if these engines have a tendency to burn oil. Now it's very possible the engine ran a little low on oil just because of this issue and that's why it spun a connecting rod bearing. You can see that there's some damage inside of here as well. Now taking a look at the aluminum block here, you can see the oil is going to flow from the upper oil pan through the lower part of the block and then into this main part of the block over here. It's then going to exit out through here and cross over to the timing chain cover and then go back down into the middle here through this galley and that's what's going to lubricate these oil sprayers. Now taking a look inside of here, you can see that there's no notable damage inside of the block itself. There are a few strokes over here from piston slap and you can see conversely on the piston itself there's a little bit of wear on the side other than that though the block did not suffer any damage from running too low on oil luckily this block can be saved taking a look at a cooling setup the VQ engines use a water pump that's driven off of the timing chain which I don't like because it's a little hard to access that's going to directly drive coolant down inside of the cooling jacket over here now most VQ engines use an open block design which means that although it's not good for strength it gives you maximum cooling by allowing the cooling jacket to completely encapsulate the combustion chamber and it actually runs down pretty deep about half my brother's toothbrush now taking a look at the VQ engine head here you can see you've got four valves per cylinder the two bigger valves are for your variable valve lift system for the intake and the two smaller ones for the exhaust with the spark plug down the middle here you can see we've got the exhaust ports the exhaust camshaft itself does not have variable valve timing while the intake side has variable valve timing and variable valve lift These also use a direct cam on bucket design there's no rocker arms like the VTEC system and that's going to directly act down on the valve spring to push the valve down now the main feature of this engine is the variable valve lift system which is pretty innovative so let's take a quick look at how that works. Now in a normal combustion engine these valves here have a set height that allows them to open up during the intake stroke while air is being drawn into the combustion chamber. They also close down when air is being combusted and exhausted. Now by varying the amount of that valve's movement you can actually control how much air is being sent into the engine without the use of a traditional throttle body. Now taking a look at the setup here we've got the intake camshaft with your traditional variable valve timing cam phaser which is what's going to advance or retard the timing of those valves that technology is already proven and we know about however what's unique here is that the intake camshaft does not have a full lobe essentially it just has a half lobe that only moves up to here and it stops then it reverses the direction and it goes back unlike your traditional camshaft that has a full lobe that makes a full rotation so although you're fully rotating this clockwise if you take a look at how the cam lobe actually moves, it just moves back and forth, back and forth, as opposed to making a full traditional rotation. Now the way this works is, first of all, these cam lobes are not directly connected to the input here, and they can move separately. The input is actually connected to this little crank over here, which has an arm that goes down to the other shaft at the bottom. Now that rocker-like assembly over there comes over here to another pivot point, 
where it feeds this little offset cam over here which is ultimately what is controlled by the variable valve lift motor now this is also offset you can see the center line of this shaft over here is different from the center line of this shaft yet at the bottom here we have this rocker arm like assembly which is ultimately what presses down on your valve bucket essentially by having that top crank mechanism there it moves back and forth and that's going to move this guy back and forth which is ultimately going to move your lobe back and forth as opposed to a full 360 degree rotation now because this top shaft here is offset you can see when the vvl motor turns over here it's going to move the position of where these rocker arms are and that's ultimately going to control the position of where you are on the lobe with the bucket now just as an example you can see i've got the vvl shaft at the back here when rotated to maximum position how it changes those lobes and then minimum position how it changes those lobes so as zero position if I put this cam bucket where it would be here and I rotate the cam you can see the cam bucket does not move up and down and therefore the valve will not move up and down and no air will enter the engine and that's because this cam lobe cannot come high enough in order to press this valve spring down again in that case you don't need a throttle body to prevent air from entering into the engine because the valve itself is doing it for you by staying shut now conversely if I put this in position for a maximum lift here you can see as I rotate this camshaft that this cam bucket is now going to be pushed upward and that is what's going to allow the valve to open up to a certain height. Now this is infinitely variable because you have a closed loop control system that can move between these two maximum and minimum positions and therefore you can vary just how much this bucket moves up and down to control how much air is going into the engine. Throttle bodies that are on this car are really there as a fail safe. Now while this does look like a very complicated system, it's a highly mechanical system, which means it is actually pretty reliable. There's a couple of high mileage G37s out there on the roads that have proven that this actually works, unlike BMW's Valvetronic. Now Toyota's also got something similar called Valve Medic, but that's tuned more for efficiency than more power. Now inside the VVL motor itself, it's a closed loop control system. So you've got a sensor that's connected to here and a screw gear that's going to move back and forth. And that's what's going to ultimately rotate the angle of this part over here and thus the angle of the VVL cam on this thing in order to give you the amount of lift that you need to allow amount of air to go into the engine. You can see you've got a link over here that's going to connect with a screw gear so as this moves back and forth over here that's going to change the angle of this piece over here which is ultimately what connects to your VVL cam over on this side here and that is what's going to give you your lift. One of the advantages of using a variable valve lift system is that you can get the advantages of using a racing cam by just tuning this electric motor to give you a little bit more lift without actually putting racing cams in here when you're building this engine and that's a wrap on the vq 37 vhr engine as you can see it's a very strongly built engine at the bottom end but it does have its complexities especially with the vvl system and the oiling system and they do tend to burn a lot of oil if you keep it well oiled i think you have a very good reliable and strong motor that makes over 300 horsepower stock make sure you follow me on instagram tiktok facebook and subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one